So brakes, they're an important part of your rig, obviously. They make you stop, and stopping is a good thing. It allows you to sightsee, wait up for your slower friends, and while stopping just helps you, well, eat and drink a cold one. But does it really matter what kind of brakes you're using for bike packing? I think so, and in this video, I'm going to touch on all things brakes and how it relates to bike packing. Let's do it. So if you like what you see in our videos, make sure to hit that subscribe button and notification bell. And if you want to help support us a touch more, you can do so by signing up for the Bikepacking Collective, which is bikepacking.com's annual membership. Without the Bikepacking Collective, we wouldn't have these videos or the content you see on bikepacking.com. And we definitely wouldn't have our Bikepacking Journal, which is our print publication shipped to your door twice a year. So if you want to learn more about the Bikepacking Collective, you can do so by clicking on the link below. So you might be asking yourself, Neil, why are you doing another break video? Well, I'm doing one because there isn't one specific to bikepacking. And actually, there's a lot of differences or things that you need to know with brakes and bikepacking. These bikes are much heavier than normal bikes. We're adding sometimes up to 40 pounds of gear on our bikes. That just means a heavier bike and well, you're going to be relying on those brakes that much more. So let's start with the types of brakes that are out there. And there's two main types, mechanical, which is actuated by a cable and hydraulic, which is actuated by fluid. So mechanical brakes are nice because while well, they're easy to adjust in the field and even the most catastrophic failure can be fixed with some simple parts and repair items. These brakes use a specific cable and housing to connect the caliper to the brake lever. Similar to cable and housing for shifting, these will need to be replaced or adjusted from time to time, but generally speaking are very low to maintain. The cool thing about mechanical brakes is it's really easy to swap the brakes over from bike to bike, and they're generally a little bit cheaper than a hydraulic brake. The downside to mechanical brakes, however, is the stopping power and modulation capabilities. They just do not have that same capability that a hydraulic brake has. They will still stop, but the brake feeling is usually on the brake or off the brake. So hydraulic brakes allow for more modulation or the ability to feather your brakes. And it takes much less effort to accomplish more stopping power, which ultimately is easier on your hands. But these systems can fail. And when they do, you're likely out of a brake until you find your next bike shop en route. While this can happen, it is rare, but the possibility does turn a lot of people off hydraulic brakes. Hydraulic brakes typically need a little bit more attention and servicing them is a little bit more intricate. Getting your hydraulic brakes serviced once a year is a good general rule. And typically what happens here is your bike shop, or you could even do this at home, those brakes need a bleed. And what that entails is basically making sure that there's new fresh hydraulic fluid in it and that there's enough fluid in it without any air so that the brakes work properly. Well, you might not find yourself doing this. I do all the time and it's a big pain in the butt with hydraulic brakes is swapping from bike to bike because you're going to have to disconnect the line from the lever, trim the line a little bit, install new barbs and olives, which are not cheap for how little they are, then reconnect the line to the lever and then bleed your brakes. Usually with front brakes, you don't have to do that, which is super easy. But with those rear brakes with internal routing, it's much more challenging. So there is a third style of brake and that is a cable actuated hydraulic brake. This is where you use a cable actuated lever and a cable to engage a hydraulic caliper. There's not very many of these out there, but Yokozuna and TRP both make these styles of brakes and they're actually kind of the best of both worlds. And I hope that we see more of these down the road. Logan did a review last year on the Yokozuna Motoko brake. So if you're interested in reading that review, it is linked below. So briefly just talking about rim brakes, there are quite a few limitations when it comes to bike packing and rim brakes, mostly because of the tire clearance. Imagine a rim brake on a plus bike. That limitation alone is enough for me to not even consider rim brakes on most of my bikes. So another differentiating factor is the amount of pistons within your brake calipers. More pistons mean more stopping power or more stopping capabilities. Four piston brakes are typically seen on more mountain bikes, whereas two piston brakes are seen on mountain bikes, maybe cross country mountain bikes, but definitely more on say a gravel bike. Four piston brakes give the manufacturer a little bit more room to work with, which means four piston brake pads are typically going to be larger 
or longer, and that means there's more brake pad on the rotor to help stop your bike. While many four piston brakes can be overkill, especially on a regular gravel bike unloaded or you know a cross country bike unloaded, but when we're talking about bike packing and all of that weight on the bike, having more stopping power is definitely beneficial and it definitely helps reduce the fatigue of your hands. The downside certainly is a little bit more weight, but Honestly, in all reality, that is a very, very small price to pay for more power. Just this past spring, I actually swapped over a two piston brake set to a four piston Shimano XT brake set. And man, I, I just can't even imagine going back to a two piston brake set for bike packing just because of the stopping power and just the overall reliability and ease on my digits. So rotor and rotor size is also a big part of the puzzle. The smaller the rotor, probably the less stopping power. The larger the rotor, well, you get the point. Typically for disc brakes, we see rotors in the size of 140 to 200. Larger rotors typically displace heat a lot better than smaller rotors, but smaller rotors typically will be lighter because most of them won't be using brake adapters and, well, there's just a lot less metal. A 200 millimeter rotor is gonna be found on more of a trail bike, a full suspension bike, whereas these 160 millimeter rotors are more common on gravel bikes or cross country mountain bikes. Many bikes actually have a larger rotor up front, say a 180 millimeter rotor up front and 160 millimeter rotor in the rear. So the reason for this is you typically will almost always have that front wheel planted on the ground. So that front wheel on the ground means that there's almost always a reliable stopping power. Whereas that rear wheel, it's going to be lifted up sometimes, especially, you know, up over rocks or something like that. And it's not as planted as that front wheel or that front end. So that front end is going to produce more braking power. While that rear end does produce braking power, it's definitely going to help just with overall control. Brake pads. Brake pads also have a big effect on brake performance. So there's two main types of brake pads. The first one is organic resin or semi-metallic. This type of pad is made up of a mixture of fibers and maybe a little bit of metal in there. In general, these types of pads are a bit more soft, so they tend to run a little bit more quiet, but they do wear out more prematurely than say a metal pad. The second type of pad is a metal, metallic, or sintered pad, and this is essentially metallic compound fused together. This pad tends to be a lot harder, so it can be a little bit more noisy, but it definitely lasts a little bit longer, especially in wet conditions. So resin pads have a really good initial bite. So when you put your hand on the brake lever, it's going to actually really break right away. It has that really nice, strong feel, especially a hydraulic brake. But when you get into the metal compound, the metal compound doesn't have that initial bite but you get it once you heat up that rotor and pad. So a good example of this is if you're riding some cross country trail on some relatively flat terrain and you want just that initial bite, but you don't actually plan on really long descents, then resin pads are probably good enough for you. But if you find yourself in the mountains with a really long climb and then a really long descent, those metal pads are great because they work consistently feeling really good throughout that whole descent. And I typically run a metal pad for that reason alone, especially here in Colorado. So there are a few things that you will want to look out for with your brake pads and your rotors. First off is noise or more noise than normal. This often means that your pads and or rotors are contaminated. The other thing is a chattering or where the pad and the rotor just basically aren't really meeting up all that well. And this happens from time to time when the rotors are contaminated or they weren't bedded in properly in the first place or something of the sort. If your rotors and pads are contaminated, typically the best place for those items are the trash can. That being said, there are things that you can do to maybe help decontaminate those rotors, but the first thing you'll wanna do is to make sure not to cross-contaminate. So if you have a contaminated rotor or a contaminated brake pad, do not throw a new rotor or new brake pads on that system because you'll just contaminate those. So I'll use rubbing alcohol on the rotor and try to just clean off all that stuff on the rotor and make sure those contaminants are off. And then I'll use a fresh side of some sandpaper or a sand block and try to basically sand down the contaminated part of the brake pad. There are brake cleaners, but this is definitely more of a specialty item and maybe a little bit more toxic, but your local bike shop can get this stuff for you. And if your issues persist, bring your bike into a local bike shop because they are the experts and they have dealt with a whole lot of brake issues in the past. 
I'm sure they've run into your issue before as well. Generally speaking, rotors and pads, they both wear out and you'll need to replace them. So typically with brake pads, you're going to want to replace those pads when the pad itself is one millimeter or less. This will ensure that you don't actually wear down the pad so much that it wears down the spring or the backing of the pad because once you wear down those parts, you are also wearing down your rotor and ruining your rotor. Almost all rotors have minimum thickness indicators on them. Uh, these Shimano rotors are a 1.5 millimeter. So I find that using these digital calipers on these rotors are a great tool. So bike packing and brakes. Obviously this is a big topic. So first and foremost, when you start a big bike packing trip, A, it's probably a pretty good idea to start with new brake pads. And if you can't afford it, B, you should probably be starting with new brake rotors as well. The most important thing before you go on your trip though with those new brake pads and rotors is bedding in your brakes. And this is essentially the process of marrying up your brake pads and your brake rotors. Bedding in the brakes is a simple process of essentially going out to the front of your house and feathering your brakes so that your brake pads and your brake rotors marry together. So another issue with bike packing and brake lines and cable housing and all that is handlebar bags are just really not meant to go on a bar like that. And so when you actually fit a handlebar bag on a handlebar with all of those cables and brake lines, it is a challenge. So oftentimes with new brakes, I like to actually keep the brake lines a little bit longer. More times than not, your bike is going to come with super long brake lines. And oftentimes bike shops actually trim those brake lines down for your convenience so that the bike looks pro when it leaves the door. Other times they don't. And I actually prefer that because I really like longer brake lines and I like the ability to trim my own brake lines around my handlebar bag. So if you're planning on trimming your brake lines, throw on your handlebar bag and kind of test out and see where your brake lines naturally will fit so that you can ensure that your brake lines are not going to get crimped or bent in any particular way. So what is the best brake and brake type? Well, it depends. You've heard that answer before. But if you ask me what type of brake I'm using, nine times out of 10, it is a hydraulic brake. And I do that because it's just much more easier on the hands and it has much more stopping power and feathering capabilities. But if I do have an issue, I do accept the fact that I might actually lose a brake. And even though I know how to work on my own brakes, hydraulic brakes are basically impossible to repair in the field. When I've done international riding, I've used hydraulic brakes. When I've done extremely remote bike packing stateside, I've used hydraulic brakes. When I went to Alaska and pedaled in negative 40 degree temperatures, I used hydraulic brakes. The one time I might consider using a mechanical brake is that world touring. And if I am going around the world where I just don't know if I can get a brake bleed or if I'm going to a country or a remote destination that just might not have the opportunity to fix or the parts to fix that hydraulic brake, that would be the opportunity I would go with a mechanical brake. All right, so now it's time to hear from you all. Are you a mechanical or a hydraulic fan? How about four piston or two piston? resin or sintered? Leave a comment in the comment section below. And as always, thank you all so much for watching. And until next time, pedal further.